Thanks a lot. Yeah, very long title. It's there anyway. Yeah, so actually, it's it's a very, it's really a great pleasure to 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 be here in Trieste. I should say, be back here, because there was a sort of version of this conference six years ago, I guess, 2013, and I was a little baby at that point. I was just starting my PhD, and I came in the audience like it was probably one of my first serious conferences. So it's nice to be back to to and. Uh, I'm very thankful to the organizers for giving me a chance to be back and to give a talk on a bit of, of my work. Uh, by the way, this is joint work with Andrei Martinez Finkelstein uh, from Universidad de Almeria in Spain and also Baylor University. Uh, part of it is already on the archive, but we made some improvements uh, that we might update or put in a new paper, who knows. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to talk more about that along the way. Okay, to get started, let me just pose a question which is super, super basic and appeared already like in, in, in the morning session, for instance, uh, during Alyssa's lecture. Uh, and you take, let's say, your favorite matrix M, random, of size N, capital N, and we start to values, and you just look at the, its counting measure here, one over N, sum of delta masses at the, at the measures, at the, at, the, at the eigenvalues, and what you're interested in is in the limit when the size of the matrix goes to infinity. You have more and more eigenvalues, you're constructing a measure that's counting those eigenvalues, so you really should think uh, uh, of this as essentially like the measure that counts eigenvalues in a certain interval if you integrate uh, uh, and this measure over the, the fixed interval. And anyway, we're interested in the large end limit of this, of this random measure. Uh, actually, there is a more deterministic side of this question, if you want to say so, which is the following. Instead of looking at the random measure, because again, this right hand side here is really a random measure because the eigenvalues are random. You can actually average that. So you take the average of your matrix of the characteristic polynomial. So now this Pn here is a deterministic polynomial. And you can look at the counting measure for the zeros of this polynomial and ask yourself about the limit when n goes to infinity of this deterministic uh, uh, measure now. So what, what I will call the measure for the zeros here, so deterministic zeros. And here the measure for eigenvalues, random. And of course, I'm saying here that the limits are the same, but this is like a calculation that I have to do like sort of model by model. But it turns out that in many models, when the eigenvalues are on the real line, this is true. Uh, so the limiting, the measure for the eigenvalues happens to be the same as the measure for the average characteristic polynomial. And that's going to be the, the case in our, uh, uh, in our talk. So for most of the time, I'm going to be focusing on the, last, on the last one, on the counting measure for the zeros. And then just at the very end, I make some comment on that. Anyway, but just to, to have a warm up. Uh, well, let us look at one model, which I can say is classical right now, which is what, what's called the, the emission matrix model, emission random matrix model. So many of you know, and many of you also saw today's lecture by Elise, so I, I have to thank her because she introduced many of those things. So over there, if you put, let's say, uh, you consider, so over here we are considering like emission matrices, uh, random with a distribution which takes this, this, uh, this forms, so exponential minus n trace of v of m. So v here is just an appropriate function, let's say, let's stick to a polynomial. Uh, and like for, so just to make a connection, if you put, let's say, v to be Gaussian, you're just exactly back to the model that Elise was talking about this morning. Well, let's say we have a general polynomial v. Uh, and then this average characteristic polynomial no, is not that hard to compute to be actually an uh, uh, orthogonal polynomial for the measure e of minus n v. Again, I want, let me just trace back to what now uh, uh, Alexander Bufetov was saying this morning. And he computed, like, uh, in that case, with uh, Gaussian, he computed that to be emit polynomials. If you have a general potential, you just get other orthogonal, po orthogonal polynomials for other measures. Anyway, so this polynomial is known. Uh, this measure, the limiting measure for the zeros or for the random eigenvalues exists. They're the same, let's say, almost surely, if we're talking about the eigenvalues. Uh, and this measure minimizes the, the log energy uh, the weighted log energy on the real line. So if you want to find this mu star, what you should do, you should look at lots of measures on the real line, so every probability measure on the real line, and then you compute this double integral for this measure, plus this single integral with your potential, and then you minimize this quantity over all probability measures, right? So you give me a probability measure, compute this quantity here, this gives me a number, and I minimize this number over all probability measures on the real line, and the one minimizing it is exactly the one that's going to be mu star. It's going to describe the limiting eigenvalue distribution in that case. There's another characterization of this measure, which is perhaps not 
well used, but we're going to need, or at least we're going to generalize that uh, uh, immediately, which is the following. So if you compute, if, okay, suppose that you, you know already this limiting measure, and then you compute this Cauchy, or it's Cauchy transform, or sometimes called also still this transform, right? Just a transform, right? a, a, a transform of the measure, so, so as a function, right? So it's a function of z, analytic function of z outside the support of mu star, and it turns out that this function here satisfies an algebraic equation. Uh, where this algebraic equation here, because V is a polynomial, this algebra, this, those A1 and A0, they're also polynomials. Uh, uh, so you can imagine that, you know, for each Z, you solve for Xi, you have two solutions. One of these solutions is exactly this analytic function, which is the limiting eigenvalue distribution. And I must say that this is some sort of characterization. So if you look at the equilibrium measure here, this is very, I mean, there's a unique measure minimizing this functional. So you know that, so there is uniqueness of mu star to this characterization as a minimizer. But also, in some sense, if you impose some conditions in, on A1 and A0, there is a unique measure on the real line that satisfies uh, the corresponding algebraic equation in some sense. So in some sense, you can think about this, this algebraic equation as uniquely determining your limiting eigenvalue distribution. Right? So just have in mind two main objects here an energy minimization to determine your eigenvalue distribution, or also an uh, algebraic curve, or what's called spectral curve, to determine the limiting distribution. Right? Again, if you didn't follow any of this, let's be very concrete. As I told you, if you consider, let's say, V to be a Gaussian, uh, so it potentially be a Gaussian, then essentially we're talking about matrices whose entries are independent Gaussian, appropriately normalized. Uh, your average characteristic polynomials are mid-polynomials, I mentioned. Uh, the limiting uh, eigenvalue distribution is just the semicircle, the semicircle distribution uh, on minus root 2 to root 2. And this algebraic equation is very explicit and is over here, right? So A naught is just constant equals 2. And, 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 and this A1 is Z. And then you can solve here very easily for Xi. And then you can recover the Austerius transform. And from there, you can recover the, 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 the measure itself if you, if you want to, right? Okay, so we're going to now uh, uh, look at that picture, at those type of results, but for another matrix model, which is a kind of very, I would say, nature, very simple, at least, generalization, which is when we consider the, the, the very old trace of, of V of M, but now we just add some perturbation here, a polynomial perturbation, or, or sorry, a matrix perturbation of this V, which is given by minus AM, where this A here that you see is a deterministic matrix which actually uh, we can fix to be a, a diagonal by, because you can essentially diagonalize M and fix A, a to be diagonal. Anyway, uh, and this is called the external, the external source, this matrix A. Uh, and V, as before, is just a fixed real polynomial, right? And for the talk today, I will fix, our results fix on actually A with a certain form, which is when you have uh, only two distinct eigenvalues, the symmetry that imposing that A uh, of A or minus A is not a big deal. You can always change your potential reduced to that if you don't have symmetric eigenvalues. Uh, but what we cannot reduce that we are uh, we're imposing different, possibly different multiplicities. Let's say A comes with multiplicity N1 minus A comes with multiplicity N2. They don't have to be the same, right? Uh, for me, uh, some of the, our results, we believe, although we didn't do, we believe that they can be extended to general A with more distinct eigenvalues. I might make some comments at the end. But for now, let's just, for our results, we're going to be uh, restricted to this situation here. Okay, so the picture that you see there is exactly what we discussed already about the standard uh, emission matrix model. So we start with a counting measure for eigenvalues or counting measure for zeros of the average characteristic polynomial, and we understand the limit, if it exists. So let's say, can we write down some sort of variational problem that characterizes this limit? Before, we saw that for the emission matrix model, you minimize a log energy with a weight on the real line, and you get the measure that you want. Uh, on the other hand, you can also look at a more analytic uh, from a more analytic perspective, you can look at, or more complex analytic perspective, you can look at, let's say, 
uh, uh, your co the Cauchy transform of your limiting measure, if it exists, and try to see if it has some properties. Let's say if it solves an algebraic equation, as we saw before in the emission matrix model, when a equals zero, identically zero, you just get a, a, quadrat uh, a quadratic equation in the Cauchy transform. And from that, perhaps you want to see sort of local properties for your measure, or in other words, you want to perhaps classify universality classes, whatever that means. Uh, okay, so when A equals zero, again, we just recovered the emission matrix model that I showed you the first, uh, the, in the, one of the first slides, and so this, this whole description is, is well known. Right? Uh, I have to make some, of course, make several, uh, 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 I have to thank several authors, many of those in the audience, for lots of things I've learned from them. Uh, for instance, if you consider this polynomial V to be symmetric, and also when the multiplicities are the same for the perturbation for this external source A, there are several partial results in the literature. Again, a very symmetric situation. Uh, let's say you could also fix, let's say, N1 and make N2 e equal zero, or sorry, I should make A or minus A equal zero, just fix, let's say, one. Uh, one, this thing I can value with small multiplicity. That's kind of a small perturbation unitary ensemble. This has also been studied in the literature. And also, when you make, let's say, your external source as general as you want, but you make, let's say, just a Gaussian potential, there are also several people here in the audience who contributed to that. Uh, and so there are things that are known in, in various different uh, uh, setups. As far as I could trace back, uh, there's not much known for the situation that I'm describing, although there are lots of natural questions with natural answers already available, although no natural proofs, let's put it this way. Uh, anyway, so okay, here's the picture, and what we're going to talk about today is the following. So first, can you go from, let's say, a, let's say a set of points, so let's say a, 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 a variational a variational characterization and then find a uh, spectral curve, an algebraic equation, and the answer is yes. We, we were able to do that back in 2016. I'm not going to talk much about that today. Uh, recently, what we posted on the archives, let's say the other arrows, so we somehow can start from the algebraic equation with a certain structure and then obtain the corresponding variational problem, and from there, from there we can classify all universality classes. So from, just from the, from the algebraic equation or from the spectral curve. And again, why we start with that uh, uh, algebraic equation? Well, because there were all those cases before that told us, hey, perhaps the structure of the algebraic equation should be of this form. So we start from there, from the structure that we wanted. We did lots of things, and then we went back and said, wait, but we have at the end to prove something concretely for the matrix model, not only starting from let's say the ideal situation of an algebraic equation, and we were very, Lucky, actually, we managed to prove in the past few weeks that actually there is a limiting measure under very mild conditions, which at least told me it's a hard condition anyway, but I'm going to tell you later. But anyway, under some very mild conditions I'm going to show you today, we can actually prove that there is a limit of, this, uh, uh, of those counting measures, at least along subsequences. And any such limit along subsequences has all the characterizations that I just told you about and that I'm going to describe today. Yep. Okay, so this is basically the picture that tells you everything they're going to discuss today. But let's go a bit to the results. Uh, the first result that I want to talk about to you today is some sort of finite version of this algebraic equation. And that will give us a hint of the, let's say, infinite n uh, version of it. And this version is as follows. I just have to introduce some quantities. So remember that I told you before that in the when a equals zero in the standard emission matrix model, the average characteristic polynomial is just orthogonal polynomial. Now we don't have necessarily orthogonal polynomials, but we have a slight generalization, which is what's called a multiple orthogonal polynomial. So for orthogonal polynomials, what you do is just ask the polynomial to be orthonormal with respect to one fixed weight and now possible monomials except for the degree of the polynomial itself, right? Now, instead of asking for, all the to, for the polynomial to be orthogonal with respect to all monomials, we split the monomials into two groups. And then we ask for our polynomial to be orthogonal uh, to have, let's say, uh, whoops, where is my pointer? Ooh, my pointer just disappeared. Or my computer just collapsed. <laughs> okay, so. There was a pointer here somewhere. 
I. Okay, so instead of asking for, let's say, all polynomials, for, for the polynomial to be orthogonal with all monomials, you split the monomials into two groups, and then you ask for the polynomial to be orthogonal respect to, let's say, some monomials for one measure and some other monomials for another measure. And, uh, yes, perhaps. Yeah, you can do it. Ah, okay. yeah, it will come back. I can talk in the meanwhile. Yeah, so you just change those orthogonality conditions split into two different groups. And if you look at those conditions over there, you can just put it there. Yeah. And if you just look at those conditions over there, if you just count, yeah, thank you. If you just count the conditions over here, I have, let's say, uh, Let's say K1, con K1 condition the first line, K2 condition the second line, so I fully determine a polynomial degree K1 plus K2. If I impose this polynomial to be of degree K1 plus K2 and morning, right? So this, those conditions determine uniquely a polynomial. It turns out that the average characteristic polynomial satisfies those conditions, right? So it's a characterization of this average characteristic polynomial in terms of multiple orthogonality conditions. Uh, and I'm going to need that. And then what do you do? If you look at that, uh, uh, those multiple orthogonal polynomials, they depend on both N1 and A2, the multiplicity. You can play around and then reduce one multiplicity or the other multiplicity, and then you can construct a vector. So here's the average characteristic polynomial, and the other two are just polynomials that you obtain when you reduce the, uh, uh, the orthogonality conditions by one, one way or the other. So, and then you multiply by E of minus NV, so this is sort of a wave function, right? Um, well, the first result that this wave function here satisfies a, a first order ODE with where this R here is, is a, a polynomial, is a matrix with polynomial coefficients. I don't even want to put this as a result, as a theorem, because for people who are familiar with integral systems, this is pretty much almost trivial. It's just a calculation that you do and you verify, right? So this is not exactly a theorem, but it's there. Well, but what perhaps we can put as a theorem is how, is how this actually characteristic equation of this polynomial R looks like. So again, so the setup is that we have a potential uh, external source here, and we are going to look at the limit when the multiplicity n1 over n converges to a certain parameter alpha here. Right? So I'm fixing uh, uh, one rate of convergence for one of the multiplicities. Uh, and then basically you take that polynomial R in the ODE and then you compute this average is its characteristic equation, right? So you take, just take the determinant, the characteristic polynomial of the ODE, right? And this ODE has a very special form. It's a cubic, which just followed because R has, is a matrix of size three. Right? But then there's like a V prime here, a coefficient. There's some coefficients A1 and A0, which are polynomial just because R is a polynomial, no big deal so far. But perhaps what's not so simple, it took us a bit of calculations to do, which is to see that actually this degree of A1 is at most the degree of V minus two. And even more special, we can compute exactly the first two coefficients here of this R. We don't know R exactly, although we have a representation for R which is not very explicit, but we can still do stuff with that. Anyway, and then this A0 here is just like, connects back to the potential, the external source, and also the multiplicity parameter in this form. Here, again, so Vm here is the leading coefficient of V, Vm minus one is the second leading coefficient of V, and then you have a square, alpha. Anyway, the important, uh, it's not very important how it looks like, just have in mind that we're just making a connection between, let's say, if you give me the data V, A, and alpha, there is a way to connect those coefficients with those, right? So, a way to comp not exactly compute the whole coefficient, the whole a zero and a naught, but at least the very first few coefficients. Whoops. And uh, second, also, uh, this perhaps like the most important, that's why we call this some sort of finite end version of the spectral curve. Suppose that you can actually, that you know that all the zeros of the average characteristic polynomial remain on a, on a compact set when n goes to infinity. In other words, suppose that we are in the right scaling. Uh, and then what we can prove is that if we evaluate, let's say, the Cauchy transforms for the zero counting measure of those polynomials, and make a shift, then essentially this, this Cauchy transform for the zeros uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So in other words, this characteristic equation of the ODE is, uh, uh, gives in the, lar the large end limit, if it, it exists, of this characteristic equation gives your spectral curve, 
right? If it exists, and again, we can prove that all those things, actually, we can take the limit. These are, uh, yeah, we can prove actually that we can take the limit over here under this condition of all the zeros remaining on a compact set. Right? Uh, okay, yeah, so let me just give a few words to indicate how, to indicate how we prove that. And again, it follows pretty much like arguments on, on integrable systems. So if you don't know anything about that, I'm sorry, I just want to give a few words on that. Perhaps you miss everything, but it's going to be only one slide. Sorry for that. <laughs> but, but if you have seen some of those arguments, probably you're going to recognize some of the steps. So the point is that, okay, we look at this ODE as a vector value ODE. So it's, there was a vector psi, and then there was ODE with polynomial coefficients, but actually there is a full matrix version of the ODE where actually the first entry is the one that we just constructed before, this wave function. Uh, it turns out that there is a Hilbert hilbert problem associated with this T, and this Hilbert hilbert problem has constant jumps. And, and once you have constant jumps, you can easily verify that there is an associated ODE, and you play a bit with the structure of, those, of this Hilbert hilbert problem, and you, get the, you essentially get those conditions that I wrote here as a star, the conditions on the coefficients. It is quite a bit of calculation, let's say two, three pages, but one can do. <laughs> It's not like super, super hard. Uh, uh, but now, as I said, we also want to take large and limit of that and making sure that we can, com we can control all the coefficients in that ODE. Uh, and there's more to do that. Then you have to realize that this R here is very easy to compute if you know T, right? You just invert T and then you compute R basically, right? And it turns out that the inverse of T can be constructed in terms of the biorthogonal functions for the system. There is like those multiple orthogonal polynomials that are associated with some biorthogonal functions. And we can compute the inverse using that. Uh, and once you do the math, you realize that this R actually is going to be a certain nonlinear expression that, uh, but that can be written down just in terms of the recurrence coefficients, or several recurrence coefficients, although in a very complicated way. And, and then, basically, if you construct the recurrence coefficients, or if you are able to control the recurrence coefficients for this biotogonal system, you are done controlling R itself. Right? It takes a bit of work, but you can do it. And basically, that's where the boundaries of zeros uh, 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 helps you. So if you know that the zeros are bounded, you can play around some arguments and show that at least the, the, the coefficients, the recurrence coefficients are going to remain bounded. Hence, like the matrix R the coefficients in the matrix R itself are also bounded because those can be ex uh, expressed in terms of the current coefficients and then you just compute everything else or start taking subsequent uh, limits along subsequences. Right. Yeah, and as I just told you, under those conditions, you now take the large, you assume that uh, this, uh, the zeros of the average characteristic polynomial stay on a, on a compact set uh, and then you take, can take limit of the, of the, let's say, find and spectral curve, when you get rigorously that any subsequential limit of the zero counting measure has to satisfy an algebraic equation of the form that you see on these slides. So you see here is a, is a cubic plus V prime or minus V prime uh, psi square plus, oh, there should be an A1 psi here. So there's an A1 psi here plus A naught of Z equals zero where psi here, the solution that you obtain is the one, the limiting measure for the, for the zeros or for the random eigenvalues, right? So any subsequential limit will necessarily satisfy a spectral curve, although we don't have uniqueness at this point, unfortunately, right? And again, in those polynomials, as I mentioned, they have a certain, uh, those polynomials are zero and a one, they have a certain structure, right? And those coefficients, again, it's like psi here, right? So then you start, okay, I have like an algebraic equation, and there is a probability measure that will Cauchy transform solve this algebraic equation. What can you do with that? And that's our, let's say, next starting point. So you can at this moment just forget a bit about the rest, and then just look at algebraic equations of this form with certain structures. So you impose a certain structure for the coefficients, which are just coming from the matrix model, although at this point you don't need to have matrix model anymore. And then impose also that one of the solutions to this algebraic equation, to this spectral curve, is the Cauchy transform of a probability measure on the real line. And then you want to say, hey, can I say something about this measure? Uh, and the answer is, yes, we can. Yay. Uh, another thing that I should say, again, as I said, you can forget about the matrix model at this level. And now everything I'm going to talk about today even works for any polynomial. V doesn't have to have even degree. So it doesn't, the spectral curve doesn't have to be coming from a 
from a matrix model, a well-defined matrix model, could come from a ill-defined matrix model, whatever that means, as long as V here is real. Okay, and our result now is, is essentially completing one of the pictures that, that we saw in one of the first slides, which is how do we go from a spectral curve to actual variational uh, characterization of the measures. And the theorem is as follows. So you start with this measure mu star, which solves your spectral curve, right? And then we are going to construct a vector of three measures where the first of the sum of two of the first two gives back your, your first, your measure. And more important, very importantly, this vector three measures is constructed in such a way that this vector is a saddle point of an energy. Remember, before, when we were talking about the emission matrix model, we were minimizing uh, a certain energy. Now this third measure, mu tree, which is kind of auxiliary, is gonna live on the complex plane. So we're not gonna exactly minimize, but we're gonna look at perturbations of this vector in a very specific way, but I'm not talking about what specific way that is, but we just look at certain perturbations, so nice enough perturbations of the vector along a certain direction, and we see that actually for a certain energy that we're gonna write down in just a moment, we see that this vector of measures here that connects back to the spectral curve is critical, is a saddle point for that energy, right? Uh, also, you, one, one thing that might be important for people who like him and Hilbert is that this third measure, this auxiliary measure is connected. It lives on the plane, on an arc on the plane, but it's, if, it, if it's non-zero, it's, it, it's gonna have a connected support. And also, as a consequence of our results, we can classify all possible singular uh, behaviors that could occur for, let's say, uh, this measure solving the spectral curve. Um, what we see is that this measure could potentially vanish like a root in pretty much the same case of, let's say, the classical emission matrix model. So power of a root type of vanishing. It could vanish like one third in the bulk, which is, was already described. It could happen even like for Vigotian in that case. But it could happen also that this the limiting density vanishes like five over three. Although we don't have concrete examples, our arguments tell us that this is a possibility, probably when V has odd degree, not even, I don't know. But so the fact that you had this type of vanishing is not a big surprise, but it was a kind of a surprise for us that we don't have higher powers of three appearing over here. So that doesn't appear. Right? So your density, if you put an external, external source, you, create, you might create some sort of new universality classes, but not many. You don't get a high order piercing, for instance that case. Yeah, uh, and I, was, I promised to you to show the form of this energy. Uh, let's dive into that. It's a bit technical, but as I said, we have three measures. The sum of the first two recover the measure that solves the spectral curve, having in mind the limiting eigenvalue distribution. Uh, so the first two measures here, they have total mass one, the, and then the difference between the first and the auxiliary measure has total mass alpha, alpha is this parameter of multiplicity, the limiting multiplicity for the external source. Uh, and the energy here involves laws of terms. There are certain log potentials of each measure, mu one, mu two, and mu three. There is a certain plus interaction between mu one, mu two, a minus interaction between mu one, mu three. So sort of, if you were to minimize, mu one and mu two don't like to be close to each other, but but mu1 and mu3 do like to live close to each other, although mu3 is on the plane. I'm gonna show a picture in a moment. And there are certain potentials acting on the three measures, which come from V and the external source itself. Yep. Okay, ugly formula, three measures, what not. Just have in mind at the end that we're looking at saddle points of an energy functional for three measures. And this one that solves the spectral curve is also, can also sort of be seen as a, a saddle point for this energy. Okay, uh, let me show you a picture. So I'm gonna show you a picture of the supports in a specific case. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking my potential V to be a quartic plus quadratic, and I'm making my external source to run from, a from A between zero and one. The picture that you see over here is A close to zero, right? With A is zero, this orange part, the third measure, escapes to infinity and we just have mu one. When A becomes very, very small, but positive, the third measure is supported on an arc on the complex plane. The first measure is supported in a single interval, and the, and the second measure is not present yet, right? It's zero. 
Then you start tuning up. And then at one specific moment, you see that the support of the third me measure uh, merges into the, the, the first measure. And then it separates the first measure into red and blue, meaning first and second measure. Now the three measures are present. The orange is auxiliary one on the plane. And blue plus red describes the corresponding eigenvalues. Right? Then you keep moving forward. You see that this orange starts to shrink. Uh, and it shrinks, 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 shrinks up to a certain moment where it completely disappears. Um, the mu1 and mu2 separates. At this point, uh, I guess it's a equals a half, if I'm not mistaken. And at this point, you just have uh, uh, it's connected support for the eigenvalue distribution. So the eigenvalue is, is supported in two intervals in that case. And then you just keep moving forward, and, and, and they start to separate more and more and more. And at this moment, the third measure doesn't play much of a role. Yep. OK, uh, let me make some comments. As I said, so first off, this result that I just described to you doesn't have directly to do with the matrix model. We start with a spectral curve motivated by a matrix model. But the input to get this result is simply start with an algebraic curve with those coefficients like this form and a probability measure solving it. And once we have that, we can write down the variational problem uh, so this works for V odd as well. It doesn't have to be V even to have a well-defined matrix model. Uh, for V even, we can encode all previously known results, including A equals zero, and also including the results when V was symmetric. Everything we can recover from that. Uh, and the main technique, which perhaps I want to spend like, oh, I talk fast. But the main technique, which I'm going to spend the five minutes talking about, is actually to try to do this not on the plane, but on a Riemann surface. Try to construct those measures by playing around with the Riemann surface associated to this spectral curve. Right. Yeah, and I must say that we were successful to, to apply this to other situations. For instance, constructing uh, what's called uh, the mother bug problem for the normal matrix model, we applied similar techniques. Uh, and also for asymptotics of multiple orthogonal polynomials, which don't have necessarily to come from matrix models. And I'm mentioning especially the second one, because I'm going to show you some more pictures. But the techniques are similar, but the pictures take like a week to produce. So I just produced them for that example a while ago. So I'm going to just reuse those pictures and explain to you the ideas. Right? And it's as follows. So again, so the picture you're going to see here is, again, pretty much the same as before. I'm describing how the solution to this variational problem, how the support of the solution of this variational problem changes with a certain parameter. In this case, so it's not exactly a matrix model, but it's just some zeros of orthogonal polynomials. Uh, for a small parameter, the zeros are split apart into red and blue. Red is on the real line. Blue is on the complex plane. I'm going to play the same game as I did before. I'm going to start tuning up. Right? So I start tuning up. They start to, to, to move up to a point where they, they, they touch each other. Um, when they touch, yeah. things just start to move to the other side. Yes? What's V? Ah, here V is cubic. <laughs> if you want to look at this V, it's, again, it's not a matrix model, but I'm also not putting external source. I'm dividing V as multiple in one sector and then another sector without the external source. So it's multiple orthogonality. That's why you get this geometry, but it's not a matrix model. Yeah. But again, the idea would be very similar. That's why I just wanted to show this one. Yeah, so at this moment, after the, the measures blue and red, they merge together, uh, a third measure is created. And then you might wonder, hey, but what's happening? Why exactly when, you, when they merge or when they cross each other, why do you create this new measure? And that's the answer. Well, and that's why you have to move to the Riemann surface. Because if you look at this at the Riemann surface, not much is happening. If you just look at the plane, something weird is happening. You have this sort of singularity that one touches the other and transforms into something else. So what you should do is you should look at the Riemann surface. So let me, draw, let me just show you what this means. So remember, although the cores, uh, the cores here don't correspond necessarily to the cores we had before. Sorry for that. But what I want you to look at first, this interval here. Right, this interval here corresponds to this interval that we started with on the real line. Yep. And if you look at this curve here, this other curve here in green, this is the other cut that we started off the real line. Right. So we started with an interval and then a, another contour uh, like this. Yep. So those contours, so this one and also this one, are the ones that encode your measure. 
And let's say what you do, you, you perhaps with one specific parameter, you are able to compute, compute those measures, and then you just look at those in the Riemann surface. What are those other curves? Those other curves are what we call trajectories of a quadratic differential. So you construct this quadratic differential on the Riemann surface, uh, which, or in other words, you construct an harmonic function, which is, uh, which is the real part of a well-defined object on the whole surface. And then you look at all those trajectories, all those curves, all those level lines, if you want to say so, some of them encode your measure, right? So let's say in this case, as I told you, this one here encodes a bit of your measure, and this one here also encodes a bit of your measure. Yep. What you're going to do now, you look at the surface, you forget about everything, you just trace back the analytic continuation of this, of those level lines. And then you tune up your parameter. You start tuning up your parameter, things are moving around, some trajectories move here and there. Up to this point, nothing changes for the measures. Huh, something now is going to happen. So you see, so your measure was here, right? And also here. What's going to happen now? So now those curves are in order. So those level lines, they are in, in different sheets. They're not touching. What's going to happen is that some of those level lines are going to move to another sheet. And in that case, it's going to happen that this interval now is going to stick out and appear over here. That's when you create the other measure. But again, measure one is here, measure two is here, and then the third measure is going to be created in another sheet. So actually, they're not intersecting. It's just that. One measure moves to the other sheet, and then it becomes another measure. So there's nothing really, not, nothing singular happening at that level. And then you just keep moving forward. And of course, you have to be able to control all those parameters. As you see, there are lots of curves uh, here and there. But at the end of the day, what you get is that there is like a green arc sticking out here. There is this red arc here. And there is a blue one here. And those three are the ones that give back your measure. So all you have to do, once you are able to look at everything as in, in trajectories of a quadratic differential, all you have to do is to do deformation. And to control this deformation, all you have to compute all, although it might take some work, is actually to compute certain integrals and look at the signs of them, which one is vanishing first, which one is vanishing second. So it's kind of not complicated if you, know, if you are able to control those numbers, basically, and see which one vanishes first, basically. Anyway, so deformation argument. So as I said, what everything uh, that I just showed to you means is that we look at everything at the Riemann surface and uh, 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 embed everything in terms of quadratic differentials. So we start with this algebraic equation. So we start with the spectral curve. There is associated uh, a Riemann surface, which is the, the three sheets that I showed to you before. Uh, so there is associated a Riemann surface. And you start with the algebraic equation, just construct the surface in your favored way. And then what you do is that you, you, you construct a certain a canonical quadratic differential on this surface in a very easy way. You just take differences of two solutions, square, these are quadratic differential. Uh, it's not very important how it looks like. What's important that basically what you're doing when you do that is that you're encoding the trajectories, those level lines, and therefore the measures that you want, you're encoding them in terms of level lines of of integrals of psi j minus psi k, where psi j and psi k are two different solutions the, of the algebraic equation. And the whole point is that if you look at those functions here on the plane, they're not well defined, globally well-defined uh, harmonic functions on the plane. They have singularities. They, so the psi functions have branch points. But if you look at the surface, those are globally well-defined. So this is one global, globally well-defined object. Uh, uh, harmonic in the whole surface, so it's much, much easier to control the level lines. And, and also, again, so because of compactness, so this is like, it's going to be harmonic on the surface, and uh, those level lines that you just, that, that you just saw on the, on the animation, they are actually, they're like the le those level lines are critical trajectories, and actually if you look at all of them simultaneously, this form a graph, what's called the critical graph of the, of the quadratic differential, and it has a lot of nice structure. So because this graph has so much nice structure, it's a lot easier to sort of control what possible behavior could happen if you start playing around with parameters in your model. Yeah. And as I mentioned, so the measure one, mu two, mu three recover from the, those level lines. And in exactly this, this uh, external source model, what we did is that we, encode, we did this idea. There's not exactly a deformation going on there, but the idea is the same. We just look at the spectral curve. We look at it at, this, at the level of the Riemann surface. And it turns out that uh, uh, this Riemann surface, okay, we can kind of describe it a bit, but more importantly, we can describe 
the order of the pole of this function at one of the points at infinity, and because we know the order of the pole, of the pole at one point at infinity, we can recover everything. Everything. We can recover the support of the third measure, and just because we know the order of the pole at one infinity, we can recover also only the possible critical behaviors that I talked to you about. Of course, it's a bit technical. It's like 70 something pages to do that, but just to say that, you know, the ideas are simple. And as I told you, uh, 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 we apply to other random matrix models as well. And, and you know, like I've heard once from a physicist that if you have, a, you know, if you, if you do a nice calculation one time, you call a trick. If you do it two times, you call it a theory. <laughs> this is not exactly a theory, but just like a technique that has been shown to be kind of powerful in many situations for us. So again, the details, of course, are hidden, but the main idea is, is over there. I hope at least you get some idea from that. And you can draw, draw pictures. <laughs> okay, so I talked a lot. Uh, I just want to then wrap up what we just discussed. So we started with this matrix model with external source, so polynomial potential, external source, and, and, and some condition uh, on the multiplicity of one of the sources to convert, let's say, to a certain alpha between 0 and 1. Uh, and then we obtained uh, uh, existing spectral curve in a very specific, with a very specific structure, provided that the zeros of the average characteristic polynomial remain bounded when n goes to infinity. Right? Uh, the point is if the limit of, of this, again, we're just imposing boundness, if let's say for some reason you know that the limit is unique, then actually you're gonna, you, you can make sure that the limit uh, for the eigenvalues, so the random measure of eigenvalues is also the same as the one for the average characteristic polynomials. That's why I mostly focus on the, on the average characteristic polynomial. Uh, and actually also, again, we're imposing that the zeros remain bounded we pretty much believe that this should be always the case because of the scaling n that we're putting in the front of the potential. Uh, and for instance, if we can show that, let's say, the, the, the absolute value, the maximum absolute value of eigenvalues, the random matrices remain bounded, uh, we say with positive probability uniformly as n goes to infinity, then we're done, which I thought, well, this should not be, we don't need any refined struct, any refined like constants in the front. And, so I thought, well, that perhaps should not be hard, although we haven't spent much time. We started thinking about this, this idea like a few days ago, but then I asked Alice today and she said, well, you're asking me a hard question. How can you expect an easy answer? So I don't know if we can prove yet, but okay. it's a condition at this point. So I don't know if we're gonna be able to get rid of that. Um, yeah, so also I must say that in principle, our calculations indicate that we can extend the existence of the spectral curve exactly in the, in the language, in the, in the setup that I mentioned to you, when you have also possibly different, more eigenvalues, distinct eigenvalues for A. So the existence of the spectral curve in the large end limit, that argument, we haven't done the calculation yet, but when we were completing the calculation for the two different eigenvalues, it seems like it can be extended for several. So we don't know if we're gonna do it right now, but again, we, we, so the first part of the talk kind of can be extended. Uh, but not the second part. So for the second part, when we start with the spectral curve and construct the variational problem, that the corresponding spectral curve is gonna go to a degree higher than three, and that can be quite complicated. But anyway, in the case when you have two distinct eigenvalues, so the spectral curve is, is degree three, then we, we are able to obtain this, this variational problem. Right. And as I mentioned, I guess on the way, also it was a surprise to us that we could actually classify all possible singular behaviors by describing those trajectories as well. We could rule out lots of other singular behaviors that in principle could appear. And as I mentioned as well, like we apply those techniques to other models. And I should stop right here. Thank you. <laughs>